And as you're doing so, please turn with me again to Matthew chapter 5. We'll be finishing up the Beatitudes today, Lord willing, with verses 10 through 12. But we'll begin in verse 1 again in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, hear the words of God. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. A report was published this past January by a leading watchdog group called Open Doors USA, which identified 2016 as the worst year yet for Christian persecution since they began monitoring this issue 25 years ago. The article explained that persecution of Christians rose globally for the third year in a row, now reaching unprecedented levels. The report stated, Christians throughout the world continue to risk imprisonment, loss of home and assets, torture, beheadings, rape, and even death as a result of their faith. In fact, they found that during 2016 alone, some 90,000 Christians were killed for their faith, and that Christians constitute the most persecuted religious group in the world, the numbers of which are staggering. By the criteria they used, they found that approximately 215 million Christians experience high, very high, or extreme persecution. In spite of the fact that Islamic uh, oppression remains the most common cause of pressure against Christians, as seen by the fact that Muslims are responsible for initiating oppression in the conflicts that 35 out of 50 countries on the list face, it was found that North Korea is actually on the top of the list as the most dangerous place to be a Christian in. Those that follow, I'll give you the list just in case you need this for your summer vacation considerations, are Somalia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Sudan, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Yemen, and Eritrea. Now these statistics are a sobering reminder. A sobering reminder of two things that Christians in the West ought to think about. The first is that we should be thankful. Thankful that we do not suffer persecution on a systematic basis because of what our government allows to be done or does itself. But the second thing is that we should be mindful. Mindful of the fact that not only do we have no guarantee that this will always be so, but even while it is, we must realize that persecution isn't always the sort of thing that comes at the edge of a sword or at the barrel of a gun. And to that end, this last beatitude gives us a reminder. Even more than that, we might say it gives us a promise that Christians will face persecution. If you are a true subject of the kingdom of heaven, be it sooner or later, you will truly find that the world is at war with you. Now that's a huge realization, a realization that each and every one of us will need to come to grips with. So let's take some time this morning to consider how Jesus says we have to understand this very difficult matter, and how you and I need to deal with the persecution that you have faced, are facing, or will face in the future.
Now, as we get into this text here, we realize that this morning we come to the end of a good number of sermons, as, as we look back on it, actually over only a few verses. We see we've been through 12 verses, taking up seven sermons over nine Beatitudes. Now, before we get into these verses themselves, it should be noted how these three verses about persecution relate to each other and how they also relate to what Jesus tells us in the end of the Beatitudes, in the rest of the Beatitudes, because when we consider that, two things become obvious. The first is that even if we see that the ninth and eighth Beatitude kind of, uh, kind of go along with verse 12 as well, which also can be considered almost another Beatitude, one thing becomes evident, and that is that all of these deal with the same subject, and that's persecution. We saw all the other Beatitudes that came before this one dealt with distinctly different subjects. But here we see three whole verses which really talk about one subject, and that's persecution. As a matter of fact, these three verses take up about a third of the entire Beatitude section itself. And that should really serve as a wake-up call, that we will face persecution. As I've said several times before, the Beatitudes lead us down a road, a road that shows us what the real spirit-empowered Christian life looks like. And here we see that at the end of that road and all along that road will be found persecution. It's a composite picture of what the real Christian life looks like. And if you look at the picture of your life and it's missing persecution, then you really have to ask yourself, are you a complete Christian? What is missing? Now let's admit it, that's a difficult thing to face. Persecution is a difficult thing, but every Christian that wants to be a complete Christian will have to deal with it and have to come to terms with this fact. If you think that the Christian life is going to be a walk in the park, all sunshine and roses, a faith that costs you very little, then let's be clear. You're believing in a figment of your own imagination instead of the truth of this book. Trouble, persecution's real problems will be something that each and every Christian has to face. And not only will you have to face these things, the scriptures tell us that you'll have to joyfully embrace them as well. Now, that's a difficult thing to think about. But what's even more difficult is to think about how this beatitude is related to the rest of the beatitudes, because that tells us why we will see persecution. That, sees us why, that shows us why we will face difficulties in our life. And this beatitude makes that crystal clear, that you will face persecution when you try to act in peace. To make this crystal clear, think about how the eighth beatitude here is related to the seventh beatitude, which we went over last week. In verse 8, it says, blessed are the peacemakers. And what would you assume to receive in result of the peace that you show to the world? Well, peace in return, right? It only makes sense. You would assume that if you live out the beatitudes, if you're poor in spirit, a humble person, that if you're meek, thinking of others better than yourselves, if you're merciful, willing to extend forgiveness to other people, then you would hope that you might find forgiveness and mercy and peace extended to you as well, right? That only makes sense. But that's not what Jesus tells us. If you are serious about living the Beatitudes, the response that you can expect from the world, from your righteousness, is persecution in turn. The more serious you are about being a real spirit-empowered Christian, about living the life that you see in the Beatitudes, rest assured, the more persecution you can expect from the world. Now, not only does that sound utterly contradictory to believe, but it also sounds utterly impossible to endure, doesn't it? But you know what? You're right. It is contradictory. It is impossible, but nevertheless, if we have the power of the Spirit of God, He can give us the strength to do it. That's why the Beatitudes are the key to true spirituality. 
That's why the Beatitudes are the key to living a radically God-centered life. I'm afraid that the truth of the matter is the reason we aren't facing persecution is because we're not living out the first seven Beatitudes. And that is what it comes down to in our churches today. We're simply going through the motions, playing the games. We're not willing to really follow Christ where he leads us. The core truth which confronts us in this beatitude is simply this. If we're sharing in Christ's message, if we are following in our Savior's footsteps, we will share in his sufferings as well. Jesus makes this clear in John chapter 15. He says, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of this world, this world would love you. But because you are not of this world, but have chosen you out of this world, therefore the world hateth you. So let's take a few moments to understand this. What is the real reason that we face persecution? The first thing I want to do is look at the reason or the source of persecution. But before we do that, something needs to be said about what the persecution's cause is really not. There's many people that try to claim the blessedness found in this beatitude, but really have no right to it because they're really not suffering a persecution that's talked about in this, in this beatitude, but instead they're suffering for some other reason. So first of all, the persecution which is described as blessed is only the persecution that we suffer for the true gospel, not for a false gospel. Notice at the end of the Beatitudes here in verse 12, it says, For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. In the Old Testament, there were false prophets and there were true prophets. And often the true prophets were persecuted, often by some of their own people, incidentally. A list of their names can be found in what we call the Great Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. And when it gets to that passage, which describes all these people who suffered for their faith, it says, but now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly country, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, if you look at that list, you'll find many prophets included there. But you'll not find the name of any false prophets. There's no such thing as being blessed for suffering for a false gospel. Just this past week, I saw a headline that said Russia banned Jehovah Witnesses from proselytizing in their country. Now, I don't condone the restric restriction of religious freedom. Everyone has a right to speak their peace, but let's be clear. Whatever persecution the Jehovah Witnesses suffer for their false gospel is not blessed. Only suffering for the true gospel is to be blessed. Only suffering for righteousness is to be blessed. Now that's not the only thing that God doesn't attach his blessing to. That's not the only type of suffering that isn't included in this beatitude. God says that a Christian is blessed when he is persecuted for their righteousness, not simply for anything a Christian might do. There are some Christians out there who have made some very, very bad decisions. And because they've made those decisions, they are suffering. Those decisions and that suffering doesn't fall under this beatitude. And this is something we need to be clear about. One Baptist commentator, A.W. Pink, said this, Those who are morose, haughty, selfish, or evil speaking have no right to seek comfort in this beatitude when people retaliate against them. There are many Christians, even ourselves, I think, sometimes, when we do things and suffer consequences for these things, whether out of sinfulness or simple stupidity, and we face the consequences of those things. Well, that's not the blessing this is talking about when we face those consequences. At that time, we're deluded into thinking ourselves that we're being persecuted and suffering really for our faith. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great British preacher, explains it in this somewhat long but very fine quote. He says, It does not say, Blessed are those who are persecuted for being objectionable. It does not say, Blessed are those who are having a hard time in their Christian life because they're being difficult. It does not say, Blessed are those who are being persecuted as Christians because they're seriously lacking in wisdom and really foolish in what they regard as being their own testimony. It's not that. There is no need for one to elaborate on this, 
But so often, one has known Christian people who are suffering mild persecution entirely because of their own folly, because of something either in themselves or in what they're doing. But the promise does not apply to such people. It is for righteousness' sake. Let us be very clear about that. Now, I think that's a good quote. There's a great deal of wisdom in knowing whether we are being opposed simply for being obnoxious and offensive or for being obedient to God. As a matter of fact, First Peter speaks to this. He says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's affairs. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in his behalf. I think we should take that to heart and make sure that when we talk about our own suffering, it's not because of our own stupid decisions, but instead it's because we're truly living a Christian and righteous life. So if the persecution that we faith is declared blessed is not from these two things, well, what is the source of real Christian Persecution. What's the real thing look like? Where does the real thing come from? Well, it says quite simply, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. A lot of quotes so far, but one more today. In his commentary on this verse, C.H. Spurgeon said, persecution is the peculiar blessing of the elect of God, and it stands high up in the list of honor. The only homage that wickedness can pay to righteousness is to persecute it. Let me read that again. The only homage that wickedness can pay to righteousness is to persecute it. I think that's a very telling quote because the natural reaction that the world has to your righteousness will be to persecute it. Sometimes we kind of think that we have ourselves convinced that much of what we see in this world is neutral, right? We realize that most people aren't Christians, and because they don't really bother us too much, we see them not really as a potential threat. But that's not the biblical view. Romans chapter 8, verse 7 says, The carnal mind is at enmity with God. The carnal mind is hostile to God. The carnal mind, by its nature, is in opposition to God. It's not neutral. The devil and the world that follows after the devil doesn't simply reject God, but they're at war with Christ and all of those who are seriously following Christ. This is the true source of persecution, and you really have to come to grips with that. Those who aren't following Jesus can't eventually but help themselves to reject and react against him. Now, you might be a bit skeptical to say, well, if that's true, why don't we see persecution all the time? If what they tell us is true about living in a post-Christian nation, like everyone says, why don't we see more opposition? Well, I think the answer to that is obvious. Both parties have become satisfied with the truths that we have. There's no pushback against Christians because there's no push forward by Christians. The devil is more than happy, more than happy to let us shrivel up and die when we're only focused on ourselves. There is little persecution, I believe, because there's little proclamation of the gospel. There's little opposition because there's little real living for the Spirit in our day. If Christians and churches were serious about obedience, serious about righteousness, then we would really see that opposition, that persecution come. I think this passage speaks to this in a unique way, although you have to read kind of closely to see it, but the key is actually in the pronouns here in these three verses. You'll notice in the prior uh, few, uh, in the prior verses and the Beatitudes that come up to this one, the prior seven, you'll notice all of the pronouns are in the third person, they, their, or their. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn for it, they shall be comforted. But when you get to verse 11, that changes. Instead, Jesus says, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. It makes it more personal. It makes it more direct. 
And not only that, but also when you look at these pronouns a little more closely, you notice something else. Now, if you have a modern translation, you really can't pick up on this because in English, in modern English, there's no way to distinguish between the second person singular, you, and the first person singular, you, all right? We, we say you can apply to you as an individual, or we could say you applies to you as a group. That's why us ingenious Western Pennsylvanians have come up with yuns, right, to indicate the plural. Well, in this case, in the King James Version, you can see that there's a difference. In the King James Version, thou, thy, and thine is always singular referring to the individual, but you and yours always refers to the, the plural, the group, and that's actually what's going on here. So you could read Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, blessed are yuns when men shall revile yuns and persecute yuns and say all manner of evil against yuns, right? It's not just you as an individual he's giving this, but instead it's to us as a church that we've been given this promise, right? Persecution, the persecution which is blessed, comes when the church starts to get its act together and to live out the Beatitudes in their own life and also starts to show that as a witness, a unified witness to the world. That's where real righteousness lies. That's where obedience begins. That's where the opposition will start. This past Sunday when Joe got baptized here, I gave him his baptismal certificate after the service. And I said, if you ever travel in the Middle East, this is probably one thing you're not going to want to take with you. Because once they see that, they'll realize you're a Christian and, and you're in for some problems then. Once the church really starts to be obedient to Christ, when we really start to follow him, when we really start to treat one another according to the truths we find here in the Beatitudes, and then start to expand upon that and show that righteousness to the world, then we will start to really see that opposition. Then we'll really start to see that pushback. Now I have to move on here, because if I left the sermon here, I would be shortchanging this beatitude a bit. Because the reality is true, that in this congregation there are many people, many people who are obedient to God, many faithful Christians who are serious about living out the gospel, and many of you who have and will face real persecution because of your faith. And we can also look to this beatitude for comfort in those times. And in that, we really have to understand the reality of this persecution. When you and I think of persecution, we have to ask ourselves, what comes to mind, right? We think of groups of Romans hiding in the catacombs trying to escape the Colosseum, or Syrian Christians, right, over in the Middle East fleeing from their churches when they're blown up by ISIS. But consider verse 11 and ask yourself, what is the main, what is the first weapon of persecution here. Verse 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. The primary tool of persecutors are words. And that's as true as here in America as it is in Afghanistan. One commentator said persecution of the tongue is more common but not less cruel than that of the hand. You and I need to be aware of that. We will face persecution. Perhaps not government condoned persecution, perhaps not violent persecution, but people, when they see you living a righteous life, they will persecute you. And they'll start by persecuting you with, your, with their words. If you're a Christian, and truly a Christian, people will often criticize you. People will gossip about you. People will lie to you and about you. And that is a true reality that each and every one of us must come to grips with. That's a simple fact that you as a Christian will face in your life. Which brings us to our last point here. There is a reason for persecution. There is a reality in persecution, but there is also a response to persecution. A response that you and I have to be sure that we get right. 
It's kind of interesting when I go out to the hospital or the nursing home and looking for a passage to share with someone who is sick or uh, dying, I often turn to the Psalms. And it's kind of difficult to find the exact right Psalm because I'll start by reading a Psalm and there will be a lot of verses about comfort. But all of a sudden, those verses about comfort will turn into verses where David's speaking about overcoming his enemies and laying them waste, right? So I could go into the hospital and read a verse like this, God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Yea, the righteous also shall see it and fear and laugh. But that wouldn't be very comforting. We see the Psalms is filled with this kind of stuff. Everywhere in the Psalms, we see David rejoicing over the defeat of his enemies. Not because they have been defeated, but because they will be defeated. And he has a sure and certain faith that he'll be vindicated in spite of the persecution. Just consider three of these instances. Psalm 13, verse 4. Mine enemies say, I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I'm moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy, and my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. Psalm 31. I will be glad and rejoice in mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul's adversaries. Psalm 109, 28. Let them curse, but bless you, Lord. When they arise, let them be ashamed, but let thy servant rejoice. You see, we see this constantly in the Psalms in David's life because we see this constantly in Jesus' life. We can rejoice in suffering. You can rejoice in persecution because you're following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And where are those footsteps surely leading? Well, they're leading to the kingdom of heaven. This is how the Beatitudes start. This is how the Beatitudes end. The Beatitudes start in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Beatitudes end in verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, persecution will give you the perspective that you need to rejoice and live faithfully in Christ Jesus. That's what persecution does for you, and that's what persecution does for me. Now, I think we're all enjoying Judy's beautiful arrangements here on the pulpit and uh, here at the front, but there's one that you may not be enjoying so much. You probably thought Judy was off her rocker when you, when you saw this in here, but actually I brought this one in. Uh, and I found this in the woods as I was on a walk yesterday, and I thought this is a perfect picture of this sermon. Anyone know what this plant is? Woodsmen out there that know? Well, it's a may apple, I think that's what they call it. But you can't hardly tell, really. You see these out in the woods uh, in the spring when you have rich uh, fertile soils and a lot of rain. And, you know, usually much a bigger plant because the leaves spread out. But you see this one had a little bit of a problem here. When it started to grow up, somehow it got tangled in a bunch of leaves. And now you can see those leaves are trying to strangle it a little bit. Well, I thought that's a perfect illustration of exactly what we're talking about in our sermon today. When you truly start to grow in your faith, sooner or later, the world will come and try to strangle you. You know, if you're looking in the uh, field guide for a picture of a May apple, it won't look like this, right? It'll look nice and big with the flowers out. But when you're persecuted, your life won't look like the picture you have in your mind. Really? Will it? No. It'll look cramped. It'll look mangled sometimes. But you will be a Mayapple indeed. You'll be a Christian indeed. Now, will this Mayapple fail? Was it done and over? No. Just because it didn't have big, beautiful leaves doesn't mean it won't serve its purpose. Because sooner or later, that little flower right there in the middle will bloom and bud. It'll show you a beautiful white little flower that shows its beauty to the world. And it'll have seeds in it, seeds that will be sown into the ground to give the next generation life. Ladies and gentlemen, 
There may be dead leaves in your life trying to persecute you, trying to strangle you. Your life may not look like the picture that you desire it to picture, but you can rejoice in what the Lord's doing in your life because you're sowing seeds for the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for you shall receive the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the word today that guides us and encourages us. Lord, we ask that you might help us to live the fruitful Christian life, that we might live out the spirit-empowered Christian life in these Beatitudes. Lord, we know this isn't something we can do on our own strength or on our own power, but instead we need your sustenance. We need your guidance each and every day. Because persecution, persecution will come that we can't handle on our own. But instead, you can give us the strength to suffer through it and follow in the footsteps of our Savior. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.